Welcome back, everybody. Well, here we are in the auditorium, the virtual auditorium, awaiting one of the highlights of our show this year, Master Investor Show 2020, with our chairman, Jim Mellon, who will be giving his insights into the world in 2021. Jim will be followed by a fintech panel chaired by Richard Berry of the Good Money Guide. These are two very worthwhile events. I'm sure you'll agree, ladies and gentlemen. Over to Jim Mellon. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very sorry that we're not all together as we have been for the last 16 years in the splendid uh, hall in Islington that we normally meet in. Uh, but uh, I'm speaking to you from my uh, man cave, if you want to call it that, in Ibiza, where we've been in lockdown now for, well, not really lockdown, but we've been based for the last four or five months. Prior to that, as you, some of you will know, we're in the Isle of Man. Um, and hopefully, in fact, I'm sure uh, that this will be the last time that I'll be speaking to you uh, via Zoom, which has become very tiresome and uh, annoying to all of us. Um, but uh, and the reason this will be the last time is because the as everyone knows, um, the days when we all have to wear masks in public places and sometimes even in our own homes are just about over. And uh, there was a great announcement that the UK is the first to authorize a vaccine for COVID-19. Uh, it won't be the last obviously, but um, it does for once put the UK in a positive light, uh, given the rather shambolic handling of the pandemic relative to other countries that we've uh, unfortunately, uh, we know all about. Uh, in recent months. But we will all be vaccinated, or at least all of us who want to be vaccinated, and that includes me, um, in the relatively near future. And in about six months to a year, I'm not saying we'll ever we'll forget about it all, but we will be back to normality. And that new normality should determine the way that investors, uh, and since I can't see any of you, but I know many of you, uh, uh, and I know that we all uh, you know, try and work collaboratively to find the best investment strategy. The new normality should be the basis of uh, the next year's investment strategy for all of us. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I'm seeing things in the light of this very good news that we do have a vaccine. I want to put it in perspective. Normally, these vaccines take about 10 years to develop, uh, another three or four years to trial. This one uh, has been trialed and developed uh, in less than a year. And in fact, it's not just this one, it's Pfizer, it's the Oxford one, um, it's the Moderna one, uh, and a variety of other ones around the world. So there's been a huge uh, effort, a huge amount of money sunk into making this vaccine happen. And it's not before time, but it's a testament to modern technology, modern biotech, that this can be done um, so quickly. Uh, the pandemic has cost the world approximately the size of the US economy uh, in the last year, around $20 trillion, which is an unimaginable sum. Uh, and many economies have you know, fallen in GDP by somewhere between three and uh, 10%. Uh, and it will take some time for those economies to recover, but a V-shape recovery is coming. Uh, and I think particularly in the United Kingdom, which is relatively cheap compared to other markets around the world, we could see some real fireworks in certain stocks over the next year. And I'm gonna tell you which ones I like uh, later in this presentation, but it's all good news. Uh, uh, this guy, uh, the secretary of the treasury uh, can remove his mask. Actually, I think it's Thomas Jefferson, but the secretary of the treasury signature is on the, on the hundred dollar bill that we have in front of us. Uh, and 2021 will look considerably different to 2020, particularly in the second half, as we all uh, line up with our uh, shirts uh, rolled up or our, our uh, dress cuffs rolled up 
to get the uh, the vaccine uh, that will put us back on a path of normality. So we're going to have a faster bounce back than most economists think, in my opinion. Uh, I think that whereas the UK Treasury is talking about, as an example, the UK getting back to normal uh, at the end of 2022, I think we'll be back to normal in terms of GDP by the end of next year, that's 2021, so a year earlier than they think. And that's partly due to the very large amounts of money that have been printed, not just in the UK, but everywhere. This very large amount of money uh, uh, combined with a strong recovery means that inflation is lurking just around the corner. And although it may seem that we live in a deflationary world at the moment, this is a temporary phenomenon. And the fact that inflation is lurking around the corner has been one of the reasons why gold until very recently has been so strong this year, along with uh, silver, and why base metals and other commodities are going up rather than down in price, despite weakness in the more developed economies, not weakness in China, but weakness in the more developed economies, because inflation is coming back. And as a result, our strategy, I said earlier, for 2021 has to be very different. So what we're seeing is that the COVID winners, um, you know, the stay at home stocks we're all familiar with, the dreaded Zoom, um, the teams from Microsoft, the Slack, which has just been bought by Salesforce, um, you, you know, makers of uh, hand sanitizer and all that sort of stuff. They have been huge winners in this uh, unfortunate period. Uh, and they're going to turn into losers over the next year or so. And you can already see it. Uh, rotation is happening in stock markets around the world. In the United States, certainly the technology stocks have been lagging recently. Uh, and in some cases falling reasonably sharply. Uh, and the cyclical stocks ranging from airlines to hotels to uh, metal bashing type of stocks have been doing remarkably well. And I feel that they've got a lot further to run. So we'll talk about some of those uh, later in the presentation. But let's look at the, uh, as an example, the UK, where I know most listeners are based. Um, there has been a remarkable amount of whatever you call it, money printing or quantitative easing or modern monetary theory uh, in the last year, much more so than in the financial crisis, uh, in the Eurozone debt crisis and the uh, referendum result crisis has been about double the key amount of the amount with us that was done during the Brexit referendum. Uh, so almost a trillion pounds has been spent by this chap and others uh, on behalf of UK taxpayers uh, in the last year or so, and it was an amount that needed to be spent. We needed to support the economy. We needed to keep businesses open, at least to the point where they could become viable again. This debt, of course, is a matter of great concern for some people. Uh, I don't think it's such a big issue. Uh, the UK's had, you know, big spikes in debt and wars in the past, and it's got over that. Uh, and the UK is one of the relatively few countries in the world that has the privilege of printing its own currency without reference to others, unlike, for instance, the Eurozone economies, which don't can't print their own uh, money and rely on the uh, European Central Bank uh, to do the printing for them. This is one of the reasons why the European uh, Union or Eurozone countries, or those that are within the euro, uh, are going to find it hard to engineer some sort of debt forgiveness for countries like Italy uh, or Spain, which have enormous uh, you know, debt to GDP ratios, because the other participants in the Eurozone, such as Germany, Netherlands, the frugal countries, as they're known, won't accept uh, a, a write-off of the debt. But it is possible for the UK to think about maybe... Uh, writing off the assets on the one hand of the Bank of England versus the liabilities of the Treasury on the other hand, uh, and in one fell swoop, uh, cutting the uh, debt to GDP ratio by a significant amount from around 110% where it's projected to be next year, possibly down to 60% um, if that took place. And it would have to be a one-off thing because uh, if you do it too often, you end up with hyperinflation as countries around the world, such as Argentina, the Weimar Republic in Germany, Zimbabwe in recent history um, have 
found to their non-benefit. And hyperinflation is something that we absolutely want to avoid. However, we are going to get some uh, sort of inflation as a result of the very loose monetary policies and necessarily loose monetary policies pursued by not just the UK, but almost every other country uh, in the world um, uh, in the last uh, year or so. German, uh, for, Germans, for instance, have printed even more money than we have. Uh, the US has printed an unbelievable quantity uh, of uh, money, and they're talking about doing more, and possibly even by the time that Donald Trump departs, there'll be a one to two trillion dollar uh, stimulus package coming out of Congress. So there's even more of that going on in the US. Uh, and uh, all of this is potential kindling to an inflationary fire. So get ready for inflation. Do not uh, think that just because the inflation figures are low at the moment that they aren't going to go up. And already you can see the beginning embers of that fire in the, you know, with base metal prices going up, some food prices going up, uh, service charges beginning to go up or service costs beginning to go up around the world. So this is just the beginning. Uh, on top of that, you've got the weakness in the US dollar, which is only just beginning at the moment, which again will stimulate uh, uh, demand uh, outside of the United States, but also increase prices in the US because uh, they will have, uh, the dollar will be worth less for them to uh, buy imported goods in places like China, for instance. So watch out for this. So we're moving from a period uh, where we've had effectively a very low inflationary environment. And the result of that has been very low interest rates. Everyone's familiar with that. In some cases, negative interest rates into a period of inflation and the Scrabble board is being changed as we speak and investors, uh, you know, the 5,000 people who are listening today um, should take note of that. So what is the best go-to investment? Well, you've all heard or many of you have heard me banging on about gold and silver for the last couple of years. I'm not a perennial gold bug nor am I a perennial silver bug. I, this is a recent conversion and no doubt in a year or two's time uh, these investments will be substituted by something else but for the moment even though there's been a little bit of a pullback in the price of gold it got up to two thousand and eighty dollars two or three months ago it's around eighteen twenty five to eighteen thirty five today and the same with silver a bit of a pullback um, the these have been great investments over the last couple of years and they will remain so there is no finer way of preserving capital than owning gold, particularly in an inflationary period. You're getting central banks buying into gold. You're getting the opening of economies such as China and India, which are traditionally large buyers, uh, retail buyers of gold for jewelry and for hoarding. Uh, and you don't have a lot of supply. The mine supply is not increasing uh, rapidly and it won't increase rapidly for several years to come because mines take a long time to develop uh, if you can actually find the gold in the ground. So gold and silver are go-to investments. And I, depending on your time of life, the state of your portfolio, how much money you've got, etc., I do think gold should be a big part of anyone's portfolio. And by big, I mean somewhere between 10 and 20%. And that can take the form of gold ETFs. It can take the form of physical gold. It can take the form of gold futures. It can take the form of gold miners. And I'm going to be mentioning two or three of those to you uh, later. Um, uh, there are plenty of ways of playing the gold and silver boom that we're just in the middle of. And I can, well, confidently, uh, at least I will confidently predict I may be proven wrong. And I have been many times before. Uh, but the price of gold by the end of next year will be $2,500 uh, an ounce at least. And silver will be somewhere around $40 an ounce. And that compares to silver's current price. Um, of around just under well, 20, just under twenty five dollars an ounce. So significant gains to be had, and obviously the share prices of companies that are key to gold and silver should do even better in those circumstances. The go to investment, one I've been banging on about for a long time, is not one to take off the table just because occasionally there's a little wobble in the price. Do not be disheartened. The opening of economies is good for gold and silver. It's not bad. It is the mechanism by which inflation will be kindled. Uh, and you can also see that uh, the ratio between the prices of gold and silver, uh, while having uh, contracted a little bit in the current uh, year, um, is still historically 
uh, very favorable uh, to gold rather than silver. So I would say that if you can find ways of playing silver, uh, silver is much bulkier, obviously, but if you can find ways of playing silver, you may get a better bang for your buck in terms of percentage return over the next year in silver rather than gold. So one to watch out for. Now, one of the features, and I know it myself because, you know, you find that you don't spend as much money in lockdowns or in periods when, you know, there's a bit of uncertainty. And I know for a lot of people, you know, that they've had uncertainty related to their jobs, to their businesses. And in those circumstances, you always get a big increase in consumer savings. So the consumer balance sheet in the UK, the US and elsewhere in the world is pretty impressive. Uh, in, in Europe, it's, uh, it's also very good. We've had a dramatic rise in gross household savings rates, which is why you shouldn't be too pessimistic about the, uh, the blowout in, uh, in government debt, because on the other side of that, you've had a massive improvement in consumer uh, finances. Now, all that money uh, okay. and all the pent-up uh, longing for baubles, for retail items, for all sorts of stuff, uh, by consumers um, is going to lead to a boom in retail sales uh, in the next year in many parts of the world, the UK, the US, the European Union, and in parts of Asia as well. Uh, savings are, are high and people want to spend them. And particularly as they become more comfortable with the fact that they're probably going to keep their jobs. I, I know that we're uh, the UK government is forecasting unemployment to rise to around 7.5%. Um, I don't think it'll get that high. Uh, and I, I think that this aberration, this uh, period of uh, recession, is a very temporary and a self-induced recession. So it's much more likely that we're going to see uh, you know, a dramatic improvement uh, in unemployment rate post-peak uh, of uh, the early part of next year. And I wouldn't be surprised to see in the UK, as an example, unemployment going back down to where it was pre-pandemic, which is around the 4% level. So uh, the consumers will feel better about their jobs and prospects. Uh, the consumer part of the British economy and the US economy is by far the dominant part of uh, those economies. Uh, and you're gonna see a boom in, uh, in sales uh, and it won't all be going to Amazon. Uh, it will be going onto the high street because in the same way as when television um, uh, emerged, uh, people were forecasting the demise of the cinema, uh, it didn't happen. And uh, it will be the same with uh, e-commerce. Not everything will be delivered uh, online. Uh, a lot of people want to go out and spend money in regular old shops. Uh, and certainly the shopkeepers um, have been improving their offerings during this period uh, by necessity. And we will find that uh, some of the traditional retailers will do much better in both online and in physical shops uh, as the next two or three years uh, unfold relative to expectations that everything's going to go online. And I will tell you that in the US, uh, as an example, Best Buy, which is a big uh, uh, seller of electronic goods, uh, and Walmart have been increasing market share versus Amazon in terms of online and so the combination of big boxes such as walmart or uh, best buy coupled with very effective online platforms is a serious uh, competitive threat to amazon so don't think that everything is going to go amazon's way because it's not this pent-up demand of course coupled with strong labor markets in the latter part of next year is the perfect and the, uh, and with lots of excess monetary printing is the perfect uh, recipe for inflation, hence my bullishness on gold and silver. Now, in terms of markets, uh, we've moved in the last year uh, through periods of extreme fear, anxiety, very high VIX levels. And as you know, VIX is the measurement of volatility that everyone looks at in markets. We've looked at uh, margin liquidations, particularly in March, uh, which were enormous. We looked at backwardation in the oil market when we actually saw negative oil prices. Um, I remember trying to buy, if you can call it that, oil at the negative uh, oil price levels and I couldn't do it through my provider, which is a big shame. Um, but uh, today we're in a period of extreme greed. Um, you know, it was just a month ago that uh, the, the, the markets were fearful 
And today there is extreme greed. And um, so we uh, need to be cautious and particularly cautious about the US market, which has become very unbalanced. And, uh, you know, Tesla, it's, uh, you know, something that Evil and others have spoken about um, over the years. We all think it's ridiculously overvalued. It may be overvalued, but um, it has become a counter in a casino effectively. And it's going into the S&P. Um, it's caused a huge amount of pain to market commentators and others in terms of shorting it. Uh, and at some point, Tesla will fall over and will, you know, halve in price or whatever. We just don't know when that's going to happen. But it's an example. Uh, so-called bro culture in the US with the Robin Hood type players. Uh, and you get the same in the UK on the various platforms of the extreme greed of day traders. And uh, day traders typically lose 99% of their money. Uh, there are a few good ones out there, but most of them lose money. And no doubt these people will be losing money over the next year because they will keep on following the same tired names uh, over the abyss when actually they should be looking at new names because the world economy and the stock markets reflecting that economy are going to change quite dramatically in the relatively near future. Now, I always in these uh, uh, speeches that I make on an annual basis, uh, give some ideas on macro trading. Um, the US dollar has been very weak this year. I think that weakness will persist. It will persist because, um, first of all, it looks overvalued, even though it's come off a bit, around 10% uh, on the index uh, of, of all currencies uh, this year. It's got further to fall if it's to go down to what is known as its purchasing power parity level. Uh, and at the same time, the US is taking economic actions which um, lend themselves to uh, a weaker dollar. And you've also got China trying to make the renminbi a more global currency uh, and uh, to, to, to encourage uh, foreign uh, buyers of its goods to accept, uh, to, to pay in renminbi and to encourage uh, central banks to hold more renminbi in their mix of foreign exchange reserves. So you've got a lot of uh, pressures on the uh, US dollar and that will persist. Uh, you know, again, things will go up and down. But in terms of the uh, best ideas I have at the moment, I think the UK uh, pound sterling um, is undervalued against the euro. Uh, and um, because of my optimism, uh, particularly about the UK economy in the next year, I would sell the euro and buy the British pound. I think the Japanese, even though they don't like a strong currency, are going to be in for a stronger currency. And we're going to see the Japanese yen maybe go to 90 against the US dollar. The current level is around 104 and a half. So that's a decent rise in terms of people who invest in Japanese yen. Um, and I also like, by the way, the Nikkei, as I have done for the last couple of years. And anything in Japan is, is a good investment uh, from a stock market point of view for at least the next year. Um, if you're uh, adventurous, um, you could go short the US dollar against the Indonesian rupiah, which looks uh, uh, like an outlier, very undervalued. And similarly with the Russian ruble, which again uh, is um, a commodity currency. And we're going to live in a world where commodities, including oil prices, are going to go up. So short the US dollar against the ruble. And the same goes for the Canadian dollar, which in my view is significantly undervalued against the US dollar. Canada, of course, is a commodity exporting country. Um, bonds remain absolutely the wrong investment. Why, as I said, I mean, the, the bond yields go up and down a bit and there are people who know how to trade them very well. Uh, I'm not one of them, but I would say that, you know, why would anyone buy a bond either at a negative rate of interest or a very, very low rate of interest when you can buy shares uh, in, for instance, insurance companies or in banks that will provide prospectively dividend yields of seven or eight percent. Uh, it just beggars belief, but I suppose that pension funds and large institutions have to have some bond allocation, but it's absolutely the wrong investment for us at Master Investor. Uh, so stay away from those. And it will be absolutely a continuation of what we've seen in the last month or so, uh, a rotation uh, of uh, equity holdings from the tech uh, stay at home type stocks into cyclical stocks as we get a better uh, economic outlook. And that's coming very, very quickly.
So here's some public equity ideas I'd like to go through with you. Now, I mentioned that we're, um, you know, we're very bullish on base metal prices and very bullish on gold and silver. Uh, the best base metal, metal price uh, play that I can find is among the big boys is Rio Tinto, which is a dual listed UK and Australian company. There's a bit of, uh, of a spat going on between Australia and China, as we know at the moment. Uh, Chinese have imposed massive tariffs on, tariffs on uh, Australian wines, as an example. But they do need um, all the stuff that Australia is producing. And uh, to put this in perspective, at the moment, you've got uh, vessels uh, going into Chinese ports that have to wait for several weeks to be able to unload their product because the, the, the Chinese um, ports can't handle the massive amount that um, the Chinese industries want in the way of copper, um, of iron ore and so forth. So I like Rio um, and we're looking at a cheap company here, you know, 10 times earnings, uh, good balance sheet, seven and a half percent prospective uh, dividend yield. Um, I don't want to get into the big debate about Tesla, um, but I would say that if you're looking for an alternative, GM is a very advanced company, as indeed is BMW in Germany in terms of producing electric vehicles and also autonomous cars. And it's selling at just a fraction of what Tesla sells at. It's actually at a reasonable seven and a half times earnings. Um, it understands the electric vehicle uh, market and uh, and it's got a bit of a dividend yield, which Tesla has not got, as we know. Um, I like uh, Prudential, which is the uh, British company which uh, divested itself of M&G earlier this year. And uh, although it's not got a great dividend yield, um, it's around 10 times earnings. And the reason I like it is because it's Hong Kong based Asian business is really super and um, grows quickly. Uh, its competitor AIG is relatively expensive. And uh, so Prudential is one I would go for. I've been hoovering up, as some of you know, shares in Lloyds Bank. Recently, it's had a very good run, but it's got further to go. It's the dominant UK retail bank. Um, we think the dividend yield next year could be between 5 and 8%. They'll be allowed to pay dividends again. It was absolutely wrong that they weren't allowed to pay dividends because they had very healthy balance sheets, the big British banks have completely repaired their balance sheets in the last 10 years. They've gone through all sorts of scandals and particularly Lloyd's with PPI, with the, um, the Reading branch uh, crimes, etc. Uh, but they've basically are now uh, pretty clean and don't have those sort of liabilities. And the you know forward P's are around 10 times. To my mind, they look really attractive. And you could also add Barclays to that or HSBC would be uh, good alternatives as well, but I particularly like Lloyd's because it's very largely UK focused, as it doesn't have any international um, activities to note of, and it also doesn't have uh, an investment banking side, which is uh, at the moment very good for Barclays, but is a very volatile business. Um, in one of the areas I'm going to talk about, which is hydrogen, uh, is Cummins, and Cummins is an old school company. It looks pretty well run to us, and uh, I would recommend that one. It's a U.S. stock um, and watch the space for hydrogen. I'll, I'll be talking about that in a second. Uh, BBVA is the um, one of the largest Spanish banks and it's just sold its U.S. operations for quite a lot of money. It's 10 times earnings. Its dividend yield will go up dramatically next year from one and a half percent, probably to well over five percent. The same goes for ABN AMRO, which is, a, 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 you know, was the problem child for, um, of course, uh, Royal Bank of Scotland all those years ago. But uh, looks pretty good to me today. Uh, the leading uh, uh, Dutch bank um, and IAG, you know, you can buy IAG at eleven billion dollars equivalent. It's uh, got all these brands such as Welling, BA, Aer Lingus. Iberia. Uh, people are going to travel again. Uh, we will not all be wearing masks on airplanes. People will not be scared in the relatively near future. And IAG, which has gone up quite a bit in the last month or two, to me, could double again. So I would hold on to that. I really like Phoenix Group, the UK consolidator of pension funds. Um, and uh, this company takes pension funds onto its balance sheet, runs them very effectively. It provides a really good yield. I like the management there, and I think it's a cheap stock, and it's a great one to hold long term. Whitbread looks dauntingly expensive. That's because no one's really staying in their hotels. The Premier Inns 
uh, yet, but they will be. And uh, Whitbread is a well-managed company and as travel resumes, which is doing and will continue to do, you'll see a very good rise in Whitbread. IWG is the holder or the owner of Regis and Spaces. These are like WeWork, uh, but this is a company that's uh, neither a sort of uh, pyramid scheme uh, as we were, we were proved to be, uh, nor a, um, a sort of run by the spiritual guys who have private jets and uh, smoke uh, marijuana um, uh, on a daily basis. This is a very professionally run company. It's a British company run by Mark Dixon, who's been at it for years. I think the co-working space industry will obviously, for obvious reasons, benefit from what's been happening. Um, and uh, it's, although looking expensive, that's because obviously of the pandemic, but uh, on a regular basis, I think it's around 10 times earnings and it will resume a dividend. Um, I like the fact that the British are increasing their defense expenditure. Uh, at least I like it on behalf of Babcock, which is one of the biggest shipbuilders um, and the biggest in terms of making, and I, I went on one of the new aircraft carriers, very impressive. Um, they, they're the ones who build the British naval ships. They're cheap, six and a bit times earnings, and they're underpinned by a government desire now to uh, increase defense spending. Um, uh, and Marston's, yeah, it's up another 8% today. This is an anticipation of pubs reopening. They're one of the pub chains that is listed in the UK. Other ones um, include All Bar One, uh, which is uh, it's not so much a pub, uh, and um, but Marston's is a pure place, about 1,400 pubs. They did a deal with Carlsberg to do a joint venture in brewing, got put a lot of money back on that one. And while it's a fairly highly leveraged business, uh, it's uh, cheap on the basis of a per pub price. And so, uh, sadly, quite a lot of the independent pubs have gone bust. I think Marston's will do very well and will resume its dividends. And we could be looking at 5 to 10% uh, return on dividends on this one uh, over the next year and a half or so. So definitely one to tuck away. Uh, and then in terms of smaller companies, well, everyone knows I like Condor Gold. I've been increasing my position during this year. Uh, Condor is now very well placed to be gold mining in the relatively near future. And by that, I mean, in the next 18 months, it's got very good management. Um, and it's uh, really done a great job in preparing the ground for its Nicaragua mine to produce 100,000 ounces or more a year. And it's got great exploration potential. Um, I expect I will be putting more money into Condor because I actually believe that this could be a real uh, multi-bagger winner over the next few years. Agronomics, uh, many of you are familiar with, I just did another placing. I took 30% of that. I'll talk about that in a second. And then in terms of smaller companies, Venturex, I'm a shareholder of, it's an Australian company. Um, and it's got a really attractive copper mine. I was just telling you about base metals and copper, and I think that would be bought by the Chinese. And then dark mining, which is up about 10 times in the last uh, year, run by my friend, James Chernside. He was at Master Investor. The last time we could physically meet, I really like what he's up to. He's got great gold prospects in Victoria, uh, in uh, Australia, where there, are, you know, there used to be a lot of mining, and now he's, uh, he's reviving that. So these are my public equity ideas for you. Uh, and then let's move very briefly on to the meta themes. Many of you will have heard uh, my colleague, uh, Anthony Chow, talking about uh, clean meat. It's something I really believe in, and I've been putting quite a lot of money into this area over the last year, and I've written a book about it, which I'll tell you about in a second. Uh, and then on the other side, you've got the sands of time, uh, which are running slower now because of the efforts of Juvenescence and other companies in this, in this thematic area. And in the middle, you've got climate change, which links very nicely into all of them. So let's just talk about climate change. In the next uh, few weeks, um, we will announce a project in uh, hydrogen. I think hydrogen has a pretty good shot of being a serious competitor to electric uh, battery powered uh, transport and other forms of energy. And um, we'll be talking about that and just watch this space and of course, we will be alerting all Master Investor subscribers uh, to the opportunities that we're hopefully going to throw open along the lines of juvenescence or agronomics in terms of a meta thematic approach. So please watch this space. In terms of juvenescence, it's going from strength to strength. We expect it to be public sometime in the middle of next year. In the US, it's got uh, Credit Suisse leading the charge on that. And some of our stuff looks really exciting. Uh, Biomass, which is our metabolic disease company along with Napa, which is also involved in metabolic disease, um, will be filing 
uh, to go into the clinic over the next year or so, several compounds. Um, Suvien is our Alzheimer's dementia company, which we hope one day we'll be able to all take a pill that will prevent us from getting Alzheimer's and other forms of uh, dementia as a result of their efforts. We are, as I will show you just about in clinical trials in advanced clinical trials in phase two with Ligenesis to regenerate organs, which is so exciting. Ajax has a very nice portfolio of stem cells. And in Silico Medicine, you may have seen in the Financial Times today was mentioned because it's partnered with Janssen, which is a Belgian subsidiary, very big drug company, subsidiary of Johnson & Johnson in developing new drugs. And our own relation internal AI company has recently been awarded a grant by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation for the repurposing of drugs, uh, which is a very big deal because it validates its technology and was in competition with um, hundreds of other companies. Um, and I should say the company that we uh, we uh, invested in uh, the three of us, the founders, Biohaven now has a drug on the market in the United States. We put $3 million into that company five years ago. Some of you will remember that Salvarex and Portage uh, had significant shares in uh, Biohaven as well. It was a fantastic, has been a fantastic return. Today, that initial $3 million investment has turned into a $5.5 billion company. So I'm super excited about Juvenescence and watch this space for a public offering on that one. Uh, now, what's interesting is that, you know, we are living in a world of increased life expectancy, notwithstanding COVID. And my forecast that by 2040, life expectancy uh, could be 120 minimum in the uh, developed countries and 100 in the developing countries looks to be on track, actually. And um, so, uh, but what's really interesting to me is the composition of the world's population, which is still growing, um, is changing dramatically. So look at Nigeria in 2017, 206 million people. By 2100, it'll be 791 million people. That's a dramatic change. Nigeria will be almost 10% of the world's population by then. China will experience a halving in the population, believe it or not, in, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next 80 years or so. Japan, again, will halve its population. Our countries in Europe, like Italy and Spain, are going to have worse than a halving of population. Um, and uh, the US will be approximately flat. The UK will be slightly up. Um, India will be down. So there's been, a, there's going to be a really radical transformation in the way in which our population with a longer life uh, is, uh, world's population is going to be distributed. And I think this is um, something that we should actually focus, have a look at, uh, because it will determine many of the consumer markets of the future. Um, you know, if, for instance, um, Japan halves in population, its consumer market will be half the size, whereas Nigeria's will be three times the size or maybe four times the size. So very interesting to look at in terms of future investment opportunities. I want to very briefly talk about Ligenesis going into phase two now, being approved by the FDA uh, to take a, a dead person's liver. There aren't enough of those to go around for people who are waiting for a transplant by any means. So a lot of people have liver failure unfortunately die of liver failure. This allows a liver to be divided into 75 pieces and therefore treat 75 patients. Uh, these pieces are uh, uh, seeded into lymph nodes, which we've got plenty of, uh, adjacent to our, um, to our failing, well, not our failing livers, but people's failing livers, and they grow into small functional ectopic livers. It's been proven in many animal models and it's now ready for the big time going into sick patients and hopefully it's gonna work because other things can also be regrown in the same way. And, and animal trials were already, uh, re by the way, Juvenescence owns half of this company, Ligenesis, already um, uh, uh, regrowing the thymus or thymic tissue, uh, which would allow for the restoration of the immune system in elderly cohorts. And as we know, elderly people don't have much of an immune system left by the time they get to 80 or 85 years old. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why they got taken away by the COVID in much greater numbers than uh, than other cohorts. So, I mean, for instance, in the UK, the average uh, death uh, occurs at 82 years and the average age at which people died of COVID-19 was 83. So this was because of lack of an immune system. And if we could restore that, we're doing a great deal of good for humanity. Uh, and uh, fortuitously, also, there'll be a good significant return for shareholders. So this is what we like to do. This is mission aligned with our shareholders as well with impact investing for humanity. And the same thing, of course, applies to agronomics. Singapore has approved the first cellular meat anywhere in the world. It's a, 
a chicken meat coming from uh, Eat Just, a US-based company uh, that we blended into other forms of food, but we're not very far away from seeing these meats uh, in wide dispersion, uh, what I call griddle parity, when the price of cell-grown meats and plant-grown meats um, uh, comes down to conventional uh, prices, we're looking at uh, two years in terms of plant-based and five years in terms of cell ag stuff. Uh, this is the cover of my new book. Uh, the proceeds go to the Good Food Institute, the leading advocacy group in the, uh, in the world for promoting uh, animal free, uh, uh, an animal-free world where, not, not where we don't slaughter animals for food and we grow their cells in, in laboratories. It ticks almost every single box unless you happen to be a beef farmer. And even then there's some good news for them because they'll be able to liberate their land for housing uh, and they might indeed be able to, uh, to situate some of these uh, laboratory factories on their land to produce the stuff that these companies uh, that agronomics holds. And by the way, agronomics is the only way that we're aware of in the world that you can get uh, retail or even institutional exposure to these type of companies. Um, Anthony and his team have done a great job in building up this portfolio and I'm super excited about it for all sorts of reasons, including impact on our environment and impact on the horrible way in which uh, farmed animals are treated uh, intensively at the moment, as well as on human health, because let's face it, pandemics come out of uh, agricultural malpractice and mostly out of China um, and having clean meat as this is, uh, would obviate the need to use antibiotics or hormones and uh, the use of antibiotics or 80% of which go into farmed animals is a matter of great concern uh, because antibiotic resistance could be a factor in the next pandemic if we allow it to happen, which could be a bacterial uh, pandemic and it would be a lot worse than the current one in terms of the numbers of deaths. So we really need all to stand and applaud the efforts of these companies to get clean meat onto our plates and not just clean meats, but also clean materials such as leather um, and cotton. So Vitro Labs is making leather, it's doing it now and it's got commercial contracts in labs uh, and it's better than the best leather that is produced by cows and uh, Galley is producing cotton. This is a super exciting area and time. Uh, I'll just give you a, a, one example of Blue Nalu. Fish is probably going to be the first uh, area in which we'll see wide dispersion of uh, cell ag produced fish and by the way this is identical to the best fish it doesn't have any microplastics it doesn't have any mercury it doesn't have any hormones or antibiotics uh, it doesn't result in the overfishing of species in the sea it doesn't result in the uh, devastation of uh, of the the oceans as a result of uh, you know large-scale trawling as an example uh, it has so many positive benefits and already this fish uh, you can see it here can be fried it can be made in ceviche uh, it can be eaten as a fillet. It's here. The question is, when will the price come down? And that's Moore's law. That's, you know, riff off the old Moore's law. Um, and we think that trajectory will be uh, not very far away. Within five years, you'll get an equivalence in price. And the FDA is very likely to uh, accept that this should go on the US market by the end of next year. So this is not something that's science fiction. It's not something that we're going to be waiting a long time for. This is happening right now. Uh, and I'm pleased to say that agronomics is one of the, well, it is the in the top three investors in the world in this area. And bear in mind, this was an idea that was only hatched a year and a half ago. Uh, and we expect it to be, and its affiliates to be deploying about $500 million in the space by the end of next year. So this is a major push for our own company and um, a major push for the benefit of humanity. So please, uh, you know, have a look at agronomics. And, and if you have any questions, do contact Anthony Chow, my long-standing colleague. And if you've got a mind for it and you want to know what the, uh, as of almost yesterday, what the current situation is in this area, there are about 60 companies in around the world that are doing cellular agriculture. If you want to read some of the 35 interviews that we conducted during the lockdown to produce this book, and if you want uh, our assessment of what the best investments in this area uh, are then please pick up a copy of Moose Law. It, as I said, the, the proceeds go to the Good Food Institute. Couldn't be a, a better thing for them to go to because the sooner we can accelerate uh, the demise of conventional farming and improve uh, the lot of uh, the alternatives, uh, the sooner the, the emissions 
which result from con conventional farming can uh, be, be go down because at the moment they result in about 20% of all emissions in the world, the biggest form of human activity in terms of polluting the planet uh, and causing climate change. Uh, I mentioned the uh, antibiotic use, the water use is incredible in conventional uh, animal farming. And for myself, as an animal lover and a non-meat eater, it's even more important. So uh, I commend you to this book. And I do wish everyone at Master Investor um, the happiest of Christmases and of uh, the festive season uh, and a great 2021. It's been a pretty rough ride in 2020. We've got through it. We've come up with some great ideas. I love Victor Hill's recent piece on uh, aeroplanes that, you know, like personal aeroplanes or taxi aeroplanes. I love that. Um, we live in a world of great opportunity, but it's also a world in which you've got to be cautious. You know, you don't want to overpay for opportunities. You want to be uh, cognizant of, uh, you know, trends around you, uh, but also uh, be optimistic about the way in which the world's going. And it's going in a good way. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm.